Labą vakarą visiems, susirinkus jau į 13 portfolio peržiūrų susitikimą, į kurį pakvietėm Patrick Murphy ir visas mūsų pokalbės vyks anglų kalba, tai tikiuosi, kad visiems bus lengvai suprantama. Hello. Hello, Eugenius. Thank you for coming and it's really great honor to have you here. American born, Lithuanian based. Antio. Correct. Uh, thank you and Paulius for having me here. I'm a little self-conscious about not being able to speak Lithuanian well. It kind of reminds me of the joke a friend of mine told, what do you call a person who speaks three languages, trilingual, <laughs> a person who speaks two languages, bilingual, a person who speaks one language, American. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, wor I'm working on my Lithuanian. Okay, we, we will continue in English. Uh, right, so in your book, about which we will talk a bit later, you are writing that photogra photography was never your profession, but you took pictures uh, for yourself, uh, for the pleasure of doing so. Could you please tell us a brief story how photography and you got together? Well, I traveled a lot as a kid and throughout my life and I was taking pictures with a little cheap plastic box camera when I was a very small child mm -hmm. and then a neighbor of ours who had a lot of cameras said, if you're going to take pictures you ought to use a real camera and he gave me a German rangefinder camera with a nice 50 millimeter f2 Schneider lens and a Compur shutter and it was a folding camera mm -hmm. and I just started taking pictures and I was hooked. There was a kind of a magic to the process uh, that I just enjoyed. Right. And uh, fr from that uh, joy of uh, photography, you happen to be published quite early in uh, major, major newspapers like uh, Chicago, Chicago Sun Times and uh, New York Times. Uh, uh, Sunday magazine didn't uh, didn't motivate you to think about a professional professional uh, approach to photography well actually the pictures I had published were published after I already had other jobs that I was working at full-time mm -hmm. uh, I did put some photos with a stock photo agency uh, at that time you could give your original slides to an agency and they would circulate them to magazine editors right. and then they would choose some for publication. But um, there were times in my life when I somewhat regretted that I hadn't done photography professionally. Uh, there were times when I was in boring office jobs thinking if only I were on the staff of National Geographic or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I did have office jobs that gave me the opportunity to travel a lot and I was able to satisfy my desire to take pictures without having to do it for a living. Mm -hmm. So so what is your main profession? Um, well my first higher education was in literature and my second was in law and I worked in the legal system in the US for 10 or 12 years uh, a lot of that for the Federal Judicial Administration mm -hmm. and uh, because of my interest in literature and languages I had studied French and Russian early on and I was an exchange student at Moscow State University in Soviet times for an academic year mm -hmm. and then as perestroika was underway there began to be some opportunities to uh, work in Russia using Russian language as an American and I went there in 1994 thinking I would probably stay a couple of years and ended up staying 18 Wow! and uh, I was working both for a private consulting company part of that time and then for a lot of that time I was working at the US Embassy in the foreign aid program that was attempting to promote things like rule of law and human rights in Russia Mm -hmm. We failed, um, <laughs> but it was an interesting experience. As you mentioned, uh, Russia, I would like to start on uh, a slideshow with uh, with 
your photographs from Russia and uh, I think we can continue talking about okay. that. Uh, so 90s, early 90s, it wasn't that romantic period uh, in Russia as it may seem from today's perspective. Well, <clears throat> I could compare it with the Soviet Union because I had spent a total of about a year in the Soviet period over there. And of course, when I was in the US, first planning a visit to the Soviet Union as a tourist, I had friends who said, what the hell do you want to go there for? They're our <laughs> enemy, and why don't you go to Italy or go play golf in California or something? But uh, I found it a rewarding experience, and mm -hmm. it enabled me to use the language I had been studying. Right. And in the 90s, there actually was, at that time, a lot of openness and receptivity to Western means of doing things. Uh, there were a lot of people that really believed that democracy would take hold and that they would need the democratic institutions and the independent judiciary and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it started off as a kind of exciting experiment to see how much change they might be able to bring about. Mm -hmm. And we kind of know what happened eventually. It didn't work out as well as we would have hoped, but... I'm curious to talk about your photographic practice there. Uh, did you start uh, taking photographs right from the begin from your first uh, arrival to, to Moscow, to Russia? Yeah, I began taking them when I went there as a tourist the first time, and then when I was an exchange student. Um, I remember once I happened to raise my camera to take a picture as some kind of demonstrator in front of the U.S. Embassy was getting ready to hold up a banner or something. Mm -hmm. And the militia were on me in no time and stripped the film out of my camera. Um, you know, I was pushing the envelope a little bit at times. Mm -hmm. And the first time I ever visited the Baltic region was in 1984, and I did it illegally. I had been sent from Moscow State University to Leningrad State University for a month. And I didn't have a visa that would allow me to go to Estonia, mm -hmm. but I rode in a car, a Zhiguli, <laughs> to Tallinn, and I couldn't register in a hotel there, so we slept in the Zhiguli overnight in early April, and it was uh, cold. Uh, that was the first time I came to the Baltics, mm -hmm. 1984. I didn't make it to Lithuania then, but... Uh, right. Uh so you're, you're coming uh, from not so wealthy part of America, uh, and uh, I suppose that uh, seeing that harshness and uh, struggle a bit, it wasn't such a huge shock for you to see at the Soviet, post-Soviet era. And I understand your question, yeah. I originally am from the South, and the South is a poorer part of the country by and large than New England or California or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I always had a comfortable middle class existence myself, mm -hmm. but I knew people who had struggled to make a living as farmers or who had, you know, had a very basic lifestyle mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a lot of Russians had been through hardships that were impossible for Americans to imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting to, you know, get their impressions of things. Uh, even when I was studying Russian in college, uh, professors of mine who were part of the older wave of immigrants uh, mm -hmm. would casually refer to things that had happened, like the Holomodor, the uh, starvation in Ukraine, Ukraine in the yes. 1930s or something. And it was those kinds of experiences that were beyond anything that I was familiar with in America that mm -hmm. kept me interested in wanting to see what would happen in Russia. But uh, I mean your personal experience and, uh, and, and, and knowledge and understanding of uh, hardship uh, helped you to navigate uh, in, uh, in this area of the world? Well, perhaps, but I can't really say that I've ever endured much hardship. I wouldn't claim that about myself, but but at least uh, uh, from observations and uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and uh, so you you were telling uh, this story about uh, how mili militia took away your your camera and uh, exposed film to the daylight and 
I suppose uh, there were more such stories uh, when when foreigner with a camera is roaming in on the streets of Moscow or other places in yeah, Russia. Yeah, I remember once taking pictures during some kind of a pro-communist demonstration near Red Square, and I have a series of pictures where a very angry little babushka is trying to grab my camera and I'm holding it higher and higher <laughs> and she can't reach it. Uh, yeah, there were a few things like that. Mm. Um, what really attracted you most in, uh, in Russia? Like the difference of culture, the, the, the well, way of living? Uh, being able to speak the language helped a hell of a lot. And, uh, you know, there is a perception that Russians are grim and unsmiling and unfriendly. And there is that public persona. Mm -hmm. you, you know, customer service was not a big thing either in the Soviet Union or even in post-Soviet Russia. But uh, I was talking to a Lithuanian guy not long ago who had spent a lot of time in both Russia and the US and he said, you know, they're really the only two countries that I've traveled in where it's possible to meet someone and get on such friendly terms with them the same day that they'll invite you to stay the night at their house. And I think that's true. There is a, a kind of a hospitality. If you can break through that mm -hmm. grim, unfriendly surface. exterior surface yeah. in Russia, then you find that there is a little something to that idea of Velikaya Dusha, the great soul, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you do find some people like that everywhere, though. You find them everywhere. Right. But I think uh, the, the, the key for, for you was the, that you knew the language, wasn't it? That was a big help, yeah. Um, uh, so how people reacted to you when, when they got to know, okay, American speaking Russian, which is not that usual, and, uh, and with a camera? Probably a spy. There were many people who <laughs> made that assumption, yes. Uh, and there were people that... And because part of the time I was working for the embassy, um, you would get to know people gradually. And there were some people that I worked with in a cooperative relationship over a period of quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And then after a period of time, maybe after a little bit of uh, <laughs> drinking or something, somebody might say, you know, well, we know what you're really doing over here, but that's okay, you know. Uh, um, but, I mean, I never was actually engaged in anything mm. that was remotely like espionage or the work I was doing was not really even classified. It was just trying to build bridges between organizations in Russia and in the U.S. that mm. had common interests in things, law schools, mm -hmm. human rights organizations, NGOs, mm -hmm. universities, things like that, mm. trying to get them to have a better understanding of each other and hopefully mm -hmm. the Russians would take some of that American experience and apply it. As I say, it wasn't very successful, but... Salavi. So what is your photographic strategy? Well, <clears throat> I say in the um, text in my book that when I was still learning photography, like in high school, I was living in a town called Columbia, Missouri, mm -hmm. where there was a journalism faculty that was considered the best in the country. Right. And I had a lot of contact with people that either were on that faculty or graduates of it or mm -hmm. whatever. And the advice that they gave, you want to know how to make a great picture? F8 and be there. <laughs> uh, in other words, it was basically oriented towards photojournalism. Mm -hmm. And at that same time in my life, two magazines that were in many American homes were National Geographic and Life magazine. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that you capture some reality and that you might want to do it the way the Life magazine or the National Geographic photographers did it, those were probably the things that formed my outlook towards photography. And right. those are obviously not a very conceptual approach. They're mm -hmm. more anchored in mm -hmm. reporting mm -hmm. or journalism or mm -hmm. chronicling events. Mm -hmm. But later there was an interest on my part in some kinds of more conceptual photography too. Mm -hmm. 
And when we look at your portfolio, we see quite a mix of those uh, various photographic genres. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, photo uh, photojournalism, uh, documentary, or even a sociological study through details and, and small elements that uh, build you a, a bigger picture of, of that uh, sociological puzzle there. And uh, so how, how you are juggling inside yourself uh, those, those various photographic genres? Well, uh, I think photography has a therapeutic function for me and probably for a lot of other photographers. There's a, a blogger about photography based in Singapore, a guy named Robin Wong, mm -hmm. and he calls his blog Shutter Therapy. And it's sometimes true that you can be in a bad mood and then take a camera and go out for a walk, find something unexpected that makes a good picture, and your mood becomes better. Um, so uh, as for the genres, I don't know, it's just fun to experiment with portraits, landscapes, macro mm -hmm. photography, different things. It, it's just, it's fun. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not some, some kind of a conscious uh, decision making, like which, which uh, genre I would use one day or another way? Well, if I were asked to take pictures of some event, I would do it a different way than I would if I were just going out to take pictures by myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please tell, like I was uh, starting this question, but I, I haven't heard the um, answer about the stories, those, you know, rough stories, which everybody wants, wants to hear about, you know, like about that militia and like, and, and uh, as I understand, you've been traveling a lot in Russia itself, not yeah, only Moscow or I, St. Petersburg. I think I probably got to about 40 subjects of the Federation from the White Sea, the Solovetsky Islands, to the Black Sea, Sochi, mm -hmm. and from Khabarovsk in the Far East to Kaliningrad near here. Yeah, right. I, was, I was around a lot of places, but I didn't have any real bad experiences uh, for one thing, I had to be careful. I couldn't press the envelope too far. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get kicked out of the country or get in trouble or something. So um, th there were no real rough stories that are, you know, a nightmare to remember. Mm -hmm. Would you consider of uh, revisiting Russia for photographic reasons again? Well. I haven't been back since I left in 2012, and for whatever reason, I don't really have a strong desire to go back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't regret that I spent the time there, but I'm not really ready to go back. <laughs> and the same, in a way, is true of the United States. I don't really think of moving back to the U.S. to live permanently. Mm -hmm. Never say never, could happen, but right now, I'm fine here. I've been here seven years and I like it and I plan to stay here with some travel to other places including travel back to the US. Mm -hmm. Maybe later travel to Russia again. Right. Um, my attention caught a reoccurring stump which is uh -huh. <laughs> which is here. That, the, yeah. Uh, well there is a story about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it repeats in three yeah. Photographs. I have a long series of pictures of that stump. There was... Why? Well, <laughs> I would pass this stump while walking to work and it would have these different things placed on it. And I never saw who put them there. Mm -hmm. And eventually I think I know who did. There was a crazy old lady who would wander the streets in that neighborhood shouting very loudly. I think she had mental problems. Mm -hmm. and although I never actually saw her put anything there, I'm sure that she was the one who did it. Mm -hmm. And there were some pictures of like a child. I wondered if perhaps it was her grandson. Mm -hmm. the, the stump was in front of a schoolhouse, a school building. And I wondered if maybe her grandson had attended that school and then had tragically died. Right. And there were sometimes children's clothing was placed on the stump. Mm -hmm. um, stuffed animals like toys that might have belonged to a child and this old lady who wandered those streets and yelled at the top of her lungs and I think was the one who put these 
things on the stump, perhaps in memory of a grandson or something. I never really knew for sure, mm -hmm. but I just took pictures when different things appeared on the stump. Mm -hmm. Uh, the whole set uh, of, uh, of your pictures from Russia seems like a huge uh, mosaic of, of various impressions. Uh, but uh, have, you, have you worked on a, a specific body of work, uh, f I mean photographically, in Russia? Like this stump as well. <laughs> Let's um, take it as a small series. Well, I have thousands of negatives and slides taken in Russia that have not yet been scanned. Mm -hmm. So. I have a lot of work to do with the pictures that were taken there in the past, and maybe some sets of pictures will emerge from those works that have not yet been scanned. The ones that I provided you, yeah, they are a kind of a, a mosaic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as you, as you already mentioned, that something already formed uh, as a, as a one, one project, that's your book. That's your book. Mm -hmm. Reserved Mr. Memory, which yeah. I really enjoyed uh, looking at I'll, and... I'll say a couple of words about it. Um, right. The pictures in this book were all taken in the American South and they were taken over a period of 50 years from when I was just a bare teenager with my first good camera mm -hmm. up until quite recently. There's 62 pictures and 59 of them are taken with film. And uh, I was gradually bringing my archives, my photo archives of old slides and negatives to Russia and then to Lithuania. It took a long time for me to get them in one place. And then I went through them. And I put this book together with the assistance of a designer, Jurgis Grishkevichus. Mm -hmm. And I had good help from uh, Arvidus Maknis at Photoprocentris, and right. they helped me a lot with this book. And I just wanted to get the pictures into some form where they could be seen instead of uh, having them lie in little <laughs> yellow cardboard boxes. Um, I think every photographer has uh, <laughs> such a at home. Would you call this project as your lifelong project? Well, I suppose that one of the projects that I had was taking pictures when I was living in or visiting the South. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, this, this has been a lifelong project as it turns out, yeah. Mm -hmm. This project feels like a very personal exploration of places where you grew up since, uh, since you were giving a lot of famil family references in the book. Uh, would you consider that nostalgia was the motivator of this uh, lifelong project? Maybe the word nostalgia is not perfect, but maybe uh, a sense of mortality. The idea that I think I say in the book that uh, I had not actually been back to the place where many of these pictures were taken for 11 years until I went back mm -hmm. uh, last year. And when I did that, it was to attend a funeral and the previous time, 11 years before that, had also been for a funeral. And a lot of the people pictured in the book are dead, mm -hmm. and some of them are now very old. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to get them into a usable form while some of those people were still around who could appreciate having a record of things they had lived through. Yes, uh, that I wanted to ask, uh, have, you, have you ever delivered uh, your photographs to the people that were photographed? Yes. To the majority? Well, not to the majority, but uh, the guy in that picture was uh, given a copy of the book and enjoys it. And uh, So you so you'd actually deliver it not, not only fo single photographs, but as a book? Yeah, to some of the pe people, yeah. Okay. And uh, so what, what were reactions? Well, some people were delighted to have it. Other people didn't really say much of anything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, uh, the representation of these places is not totally cheerful and uh, positive, I suppose. There's a lot of stuff in there that sort of hints at issues like racism or gun violence right. or perhaps 
there are hints of drug or alcohol abuse or something. There's some things that are not stated or shown, but that are kind of implied by some of these pictures. And as I say, it's a part of the U.S. that has very difficult history with a lot of violence and uh, half of these pictures were taken in the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that's considered the poorest state, the least educated state, the state that had the most lynchings of black people. Uh, it, it's also a place though that people from there are very proud of. And it's a paradox, but uh, some of the warmest, most generous, nicest people I've ever known in my life were from rural Mississippi, but at the same time there's a violent and tragic and mm -hmm. unpleasant history that right. coexisted with some of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to photography, uh, photographing familiar places, does it challenges you or, or opposite, helps you to photograph? Well, uh, both things can be true. I mean, it can be a challenge. But for you? Uh, well, when you have the cooperation of people that are friends and family members, mm -hmm. you get a closeness to them that's easier than it is when you're photographing strangers. Right. Now, there are strangers in this book. There are people whose photographs I took that I saw only the day that I took the picture. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know them before and I never saw them after. And some of those pictures are as good as the ones of the family members. But it might help to have that closeness to people that you build up over knowing them for a long time mm -hmm. that may make it easier in some cases i don't i'll see what i find when i scan more of my russia pictures but i didn't have any family members in russia with me mm -hmm. so there may be a bit more distance involved in the russia ones mm -hmm. when photographing uh, people in your family are you are you an active uh, photographer or just a quiet uh, quiet observer? Well, more of a quiet observer. Uh, there were a couple of pictures that were sort of staged. There's mm -hmm. one of a girl with a big grasshopper on her neck. That one was thought up yeah. as that would make a good picture. But mm -hmm. mostly, it's just stuff that was happening without being staged. Mm -hmm. In your visual language, uh, one can trace uh, references to uh, Edward Hopper paintings, William Eggleston's photographic language. Um, could you refer to any names that uh, consciously influenced your visual language? Well, I think that what influenced me was the photo essays in Life magazine and the ones in National Geographic and uh, Photography magazines, like reading the columns by photography magazine authors who were maybe playing around with new equipment, but they were taking it out and making pictures of things that I would not have thought to take pictures of if I didn't read their mm -hmm. article in that photo magazine. I don't think I was really consciously imitating any particular photographers. Um, but, uh, but you feel any... Any uh, like a parallels? You're, like when when well, when you're consciously I, studying? I saw William Eggleston's guide. It was given to me when it was a new book, and I looked through it, and I said, I know exactly what neighborhood that picture's taken in. I I saw pictures that were similar, that were taken in places that I was also mm -hmm. spending time, but I never really studied his photo books after that. I just happened to take pictures in some of the same places. Mm -hmm. um, I think actually uh, maybe some works of literature like Faulkner or right. some other works of literature also influenced my vision with a camera. Could you expand a little bit more because uh, I have heard I have heard tho those thoughts that uh, actually literature helps to open our inner eye, especially for photographers. I totally agree. 
Um, I'll show you one of my favorite photo books. I don't know who in here would have seen this one. It's called Austerlitz mm -hmm. by a German author named W.G. Siebold. Now he died 10 or 15, maybe 15 years ago. He wrote a handful of books in German. He was a German author mm -hmm. and they were translated into English. But his books use photographs and you know, in this age when everybody's a photographer and there are millions of photos online and everything, it's hard to do something original with photos. And I think Siebold succeeded in his books. There's something very mysterious about his use of these pictures. They're not great photos as such, but he uh, uses them. He doesn't really comment directly on them usually. They mm -hmm. just are a kind of a silent subtext to his prose, mm -hmm. but he does write about the process of photography some. Maybe I'll read you one or two sentences of his. Of course, his. you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm told that one of his books is available in Lithuanian. I don't know about this one called Austerlitz, but uh, one called The Immigrants, I was told, is available in Lithuanian translation. But um, the character named Austerlitz is trying to understand something about his ancestry. And there's a short passage here. Minutes went by, said Austerlitz, in which I too thought I saw the cloud of snow crashing into the valley before I heard Vera again, speaking of the mysterious quality peculiar to such photographs when they surface from oblivion. This lady named Vera has found a couple of old photographs that possibly show some of this character Austerlitz's family members, at least they might. And one has the impression, she said, of something stirring in them, in the photographs, as if one caught so small sighs of despair. Gémissement de désespoir was her expression, said Austerlitz, as if the pictures had a memory of their own and remembered us, remembered the roles that we, the survivors, and those no longer among us, had played in our former lives. Those kinds of reflections on photography are found in this book, and I recommend Siebold as a really interesting blend of prose and photography. Mm -hmm. It reminded me uh, this thought that sometimes when uh, when picture is uh, found somewhere, unknown picture, sudden, suddenly starts uh, building up its own story mm -hmm. in uh, in a stranger's hands. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, it can become as a together can can parallel together with with uh, prose as well. Mm -hmm. As it it feels like a very good example. I know that you are quite fond uh, of uh, Walker Evans' work, yeah. and uh, his work from uh, Big Depression era, his photographs. Uh, do you think it somehow? affected on you when working also in American South? Somehow. Well, <laughs> possibly. Possibly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of these uh, photographers that come before us have some kind of effect on us. Uh, mm -hmm. So what actually moves you in photography? Well, I think photography is based on a paradox and the paradox can be illustrated by the fact that this book contains pictures that were taken over a 50 year period. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a long time. That is. But if there's 62 pictures in it and if the average shutter speed was 1 60th of a second then it's only one second of my life. It's not 50 years, it's one second. Mm -hmm. That's the paradox, uh, that it's both instantaneous and timeless, or it's, you know, 50 years and one second. Which is it? I mean, uh, <laughs> so I guess uh, I, I can't imagine not taking pictures. It's kind of, it's kind of like eating food. Uh, Everybody eats, some people take more care 
as to what they cook, but it doesn't mean they necessarily become a professional chef and open a restaurant. They just enjoy cooking something better or more interesting than everyday thing over and over and over. And I try to do something like that with picture taking. Is um, just it's an act, it's it's a process that I just am addicted to, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been living in um, in uh, in Lithuania for seven years, right? And uh, could you draw? visual parallels between uh, between uh, Lithuania and American South? Sure. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the American South is a lot larger than Lithuania, and part of it is mountainous, but if you stay away from the mountain part and just think about the flatter parts, then both Lithuania and the American South are basically fairly flat, mm -hmm. with some hills, yeah. and they're quite green, and they're basically rural without really big cities and uh, people traditionally made their living off the land and hunting and fishing were very popular and the Christian religion is a big part of the life in both places and you see churches and crosses and mm -hmm. graveyards. Uh, here you're on the Baltic Sea Coast in the deep south. You're on the Gulf of Mexico Sea Coast. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few times when I was driving through the countryside in Lithuania when I said to myself, "That could almost be somewhere in the American South." Uh, looked pretty similar. Have you been photographing here in Lithuania? Yeah, sure. And uh, have you ever considered of make maybe? building up a body of work and, and putting those visual parallels as in, as in a one project. Yeah, I have. Is it, it, may, it may happen. It may happen. So, <laughs> so it, it, uh, it, it uh, suggests me that I should wait for something, something new to come. Well, we'll see. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, before, before the conclusion of our nice talk, uh, I want to give some space for, for our audience to ask uh, any questions. Please, if any. No? Is, is there any story in uh, Moscow that you feel uh, you feel like you would like to see the end of, or photograph the end of um, something that you something that you wish you could go back for? Well, I would go back for Putin's funeral, uh, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not really going to do that. But and who knows when it'll be? And uh, but nah. I, there's not really any single thing I want to go back there to finish photographing, but uh, I would be interested, I suppose, to see how some places have changed visually since I was there. Um, I know there have been changes. Uh, I keep up with events over there even though I don't go back. Do you remember? Right. Of course. Uh, there, there are some pictures from the south. Uh, you can definitely see that some of those characters in your pictures are mentally challenged. Uh, did you specifically wait for the second to take the picture of the man, uh, of the character, to, for him to look naturally part of the scene, or what would be just taken as it is? Mm. Well, there may be other pictures that have a different expression or something, but these were the ones that I thought were best to show. Um. And uh, there were no such people uh, in your pictures in Russia. Uh, do you think that that's the difference between Russia and the United States, that uh, those people are like, more common in, in the uh, ordinary life? The US rather than in, uh, Russia. Well, it's certainly the case that traditionally in the Soviet Union and even in post-Soviet Russia that people with disabilities were not mainstreamed into society as much as they 
have been in the U.S. But I have a friend in Moscow who works on this very issue, and she's been promoting uh, access for people with various kinds of disabilities, both mental and physical, into education and into employment. And I think they're making progress. They're behind the U.S. and the West in doing that. But uh, yeah, there was a time when I never saw people with Down syndrome in Russia when I first went there. You just never saw them. Whereas in the U.S. you might see them in public somewhere. Um, So of course. Your question, uh, your process in the U.S., as you said yourself, were sort of partly driven by some sort of sentimentality and also some deeper you know, social, you know, issues. Whereas the pictures in Moscow, at least to me, they seem a bit more surreal and just capture the moment, perhaps the, the moment of change that you were also working on personally. But so, what what were the major sort of I don't know, sentimental points of feeling and the atmosphere that you that you felt in Moscow at the time you were there and the thing that you tried to photograph? Well, I mean, it's an enormous country, and uh, I have pictures from places in Siberia, and uh, there, I think in the set was a couple of uh, people in the Tuvan Republic, which is Buddhist. It's close to Mongolia in, in Central Asia. Uh, I mean, it was just a fascinating place to travel to because, uh, you know, they had that saying over there that Moscow is not Russia. And that's very true, that you get outside of Moscow and you're in a totally different world. And uh, I mean, those democratic slogans and those hopes for progress and prosperity that everybody in Moscow talked about, uh, you would get way out in the countryside somewhere and it was still like it had been 30 or 50 years earlier. I mean, there weren't, it's changing now, I'm sure, but uh, there was always a big gap between, I used to joke with people from, people that I had become friendly with, mm -hmm. I would say to them, they'd say, how are you doing? I'd say, I've been to Europe since I saw you the last time. And they'd say, oh, where did you go, France? And I'd say, no, I went to Nevsky Prospect <laughs> in, in St. Petersburg, the, the one part of Russia that is European. I would joke with them about that. Um, but I mean it's definitely a different civilization but whether it'll ever make it as part of Europe I don't know but it... <laughs> time will show. Yeah time will tell but things don't look too optimistic good right now in some ways. Yeah. No. Anybody else? How did you end up in Lithuania of all places? <laughs> okay, well, the short answer, I had some friends in high school who were studying German, and they wanted to learn Russian. And their teacher knew Russian, their, their teacher of German. And I used to think she was from Riga, but I got in touch with one of those high school friends, and actually she was from Lithuania. And the kids wanted to study Russian, but they needed enough people for the school to agree to offer the course. And they said, come on, come on. And so I joined them to help make up the number of people necessary for them to offer a course in Russian. And I took it. And then I continued with it in college. And once I got some of those real colorful old professors who had lived through those incredible experiences in the 1930s and things like that, I was sort of hooked on the culture. And I've always differentiated between the culture and the politics. And, um, you know, it just kind of took off from there. And then, then when I got ready to leave Russia, uh, I decided to stay in Europe. And I was looking at several different places. There's actually an old joke that they told about a person who emigrated from the Soviet Union, this was back in Soviet times, went to the U.S., then came back again to the Soviet Union. Then they left and went to the U.S. again. Then they came back. Then they did it one more time. And finally, the guy at the immigration control in 
Moscow said to this person, you know, what's going on here? You leave and then you come back, you leave and then you come back. <laughs> what's this all about? And the person said, tout der mot, tam der mot, a parasodk of Parisia. Like, it's crap there, it's crap here, but the change of planes is in Paris. Uh, <laughs> and in a way, Vilnius for me is kind of like the Pirasadka, the, the transition between the U.S. and Russia. And I like it here. And uh, Right, I saw one hand there. I just wanted to ask, when you took pictures of the did you take them in secret? It looked like sometimes you were you know, photographing without them knowing that you're photographing them, but then sometimes it seemed like they knew you were there, so I just... Some of both. Some of both. Right, so thank you very much uh, for coming to the 13th. Okay, thank you. Eugene. Thank you. And thanks everybody. Lovely.